Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to speak to you about menopause and how it adversely impacts sexual function. This is part one of a two-part lecture. This part of the two-part lecture will focus on eliminating sexual pain in menopausal women. Many of the concepts apply to premenopausal women as well, but for this lecture, we'll focus on those women after menopause. These are my disclosures. I have many of them, uh, as I do a lot of contract research for the pharmaceutical industry and consult with the various developers of different products in this space. Menopause clearly and adversely affects sexual function due to pain and desire, desire being the subject of my second half of this lecture. For this lecture, the study, the lecture objectives are to recognize the clinical manifestations of genitourinary syndrome of menopause, or GSM, of which vulvar and vaginal atrophy, or VVA, is an integral part, and to also understand the underlying pathophysiology. To appreciate the impact that GSM has on sexual function and to apply evidence-based treatment options, including hormonal and non-hormonal medications, and I'll mention energy-based devices, but I will not speak about them in any degree uh, because there is some controversy about energy-based devices and because their regulatory status at FDA is somewhat in question. GSM affects a large swath of the American landscape. There are about 63 million women in the US over age 50, and about half of them will have GSM or vulvovaginal atrophy symptoms at some time in their lives. Uh, those symptoms are progressive and unremitting. They do not improve without treatment, and therefore they can affect a woman's life and her quality of life as she progresses through the menopause and ages. I wanna talk about embryology for one moment. Many of you haven't thought about embryology in a very long time, but I think some of the issues of embryology are quite important as it relates to vulvar and vaginal pain following menopause. First, what patients normally refer to as the vagina is actually three separate tissues. The vulva, the vestibule, and the vagina or barrel of the vagina. And each of these tissues are derived from a different embryologic layer. And the embryologic origin is important. The barrel of the vagina what we typically treat for atrophy is derived from embryologic mesoderm. Remember that mesoderm is also the origin of bone and muscle, two tissues that are very tough. I like to say the barrel of the vagina is tough as bone or hard as bone and derived from the same tissue. The skin of the vulva is derived from ectoderm and it's the source or ectoderm is the source of skin, hair, and nails. And I like to say that the skin, while it doesn't stretch very much, is likewise tough as nails. But in between the vagina barrel and the vulvar skin is the vestibule. And the vestibule is derived from endoderm. And endoderm is the tissue that forms the inside of the urethra, the inside of the bladder, 
the inside of many other organs and is never meant, been meant to be exposed externally. And as a result, it's a very sensitive tissue. Reminding you that both male and female genitalia look identical as shown here at about nine weeks of gestation. Think about that as the second missed menstrual period uh, of a woman's pregnancy, but then derives into standard male and female anatomy. I'd like to bring to light the issue of the vulvar vestibule. So here is that indifferent gonad. It could be male, it could be female. It's nine weeks of gestation. And here's what happens to its development as it progresses to the normal female state. I should say the normal male state. So as you can see, the vestibular tissue becomes the penile urethra. If we go back to the female, that tissue becomes what's here in red or the vulvar vestibule. The vaginal tissue is here, the vulvar tissue is here, and the vestibule, as shown here in red, is in question. And it is a very sensitive tissue, the same as the male penile urethra, and oftentimes is the primary source of pain with sexual contact after menopause. This is what I just showed you, the barrel of the vagina, is tough stuff, and it's not a mucosa, it is a epithelium, and the more wrinkles, the better. The vulva is ectoderm, it's skin, it's skin, hair, and nails, tooth enamel, think tough stuff again, and likewise the vestibule, as I mentioned, it's the insides of the intestines, bladder, and stomach, and not tough stuff at all. So here the vestibule outlined in yellow is where most of our pain, patients will complain of pain. I wanna emphasize that the vestibule also includes an area, the anterior vestibule, what I call the igloo, because it's shaped like an igloo. It's the area between the urethral opening and the clitoris. It's oftentimes uh, forgotten by those of us who do work in the pain in the vestibule. Many of you are familiar with vestibulitis in premenopausal women. Notice the erythema here and here. These are areas of severe erythema in the vestibule in the premenopausal women. Um, those women have pain with penetration, identical to the pain and penetration that you see in women who are menopausal who have vestibular dinner. Androgens are integral to the health of the vestibule, not so much the vulva or the barrel of the vagina. And this is outlined in these two um, papers uh, that I had a privilege of participating in, both published in uh, Menopause uh, in 2018 and the Journal of Sexual Medicine, Sexual Medicine Re Reviews in this case, in the same year. Now, many women do not associate pain with sex with menopause at all, because it typically occurs, as shown here as urogenital symptoms, five or more years following the last menstrual period. This was part and parcel of the reason <clears throat> that we renamed it, not vulvar and vaginal atrophy due to menopause, but genitourinary syndrome of menopause, emphasizing the syndrome and the menopause. So while hot flashes begin early after the menopause transition or 
early, even beginning before the last menstrual period, urogenital symptoms are delayed by five years or so with the most severe symptoms actually occurring at the time of most bone loss by about age 60. It's not only the, the uh, vagina that's affected, it's the entire perineum, but also the base of the bladder and urethra. These are also estrogen sensitive tissues. The tissue we're talking about mostly in this lecture not the vestibule, which is a subject of a different sort. It's the barrel of the vagina and that epithelium of the vagina, which as you can see here is quite thick in the premenopausal woman with these reedy pegs, which allow for its stretchability and very thin in that postmenopausal woman uh, due to estrogen deficiency loss of glycogen, and thinning of the epithelium. <clears throat> the vaginal smears are likewise very different. When you do a smear from the premenopausal vagina, you see very flat squamous cells with highly concentrated small so-called karyopycnotic nuclei, which are very different from the postmenopausal woman where very few of those squames are present and the smear is dominated by these large cells with large nuclei. This is a parabasilar cell. These are superficial cells. And even though both types of cells are present in pre and postmenopausal women, the relative proportions of them are very different. And those differences are illustrated for you here. In the premenopausal state, superficial, rep superficial cells represent about 15% of the total, whereas parabasilar cells about 5%. But on the contrary, in postmenopausal women, those superficial cells are about 1% and the peribasilar cells almost 40, 40%. In addition, after menopause, the cellular changes occur, but also so do changes in the vaginal pH. The vaginal luminal pH in the postmenopausal woman is 6.5 to 7, a more alkaline pH than in premenopausal women where it's 4.5 to 5. The acidic pH of the premenopausal woman provides a biologic defense against viruses, bacteria, and fungi, all of which are more likely to be present and cause pathology in the postmenopausal women. How do you make a diagnosis? Well, I would like to quote or paraphrase uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, Potter Stewart, who in a important case involving pornography in 1964 said, you should know it when you see it. And I think quite honestly that a good clinician should know GSM and vulvovaginal atrophy when he or she sees it as well. This cartoon from Dr. Murray Friedman is very uh, clear on this subject. In the premenopausal state, you have well-supported tissues, an ample introitus, which gets thinner and smaller with the urethra becoming more and more prominent and ultimately obstructing most of the vaginal opening. This is shown in actual photographic uh, way in a woman that's on estrogen, but is, but is menopausal, and what happens to her um, if she didn't have her estrogen? The vaginal opening gets smaller, more pale, and the urethra more prominent. This continues, and the urethra actually um, can obstruct the vaginal opening. I can't imagine trying to have 
any kind of penetration for this poor woman with severe atrophy. And even further, here's a woman whose vagina is completely closed, secondary to vulvar and vaginal atrophy. In addition to proper hormonal treatment for her, she's highly likely to require some kind of physical therapy or in, in some cases, even surgery in order to reopen her vagina. So what are the goals of treatment? They are to relieve symptoms, which could be dryness, pain, sexual penetrative pain, et cetera, even recurrent urinary tract symptoms or urinary tract infections could be considered symptoms of vulvar and vaginal atrophy due, due to menopause to reverse those anatomic changes and if sex is part of the equation to improve sexual function and quality of life. It's very clear that there's an overlap between vulvar and vaginal atrophy due to menopause and sexual dysfunction, where fourfold as many women with sexual dysfunction after menopause also have vulvovaginal atrophy. What about treatment options? First of all, the non-prescription treatment options, and there are many. They include vaginal moisturizers and lubricants. They're not the same thing. A moisturizer is used on a regular basis, unrelated to sexual activity, the way women use moisturizers on their skin, uh, typically every night at bedtime. As it relates to vaginal moisturizers, uh, twice a week, those moisturizers are hydrophilic agents that simply draw water into the vagina from the underlying tissue. They are, in fact, moisturizers. That's different from lubricants, and lubricants are used at the time of sexual activity to, prov to provide lubrication slipperiness, because even if there's adequate estrogenization of the vagina, whether it's from estrogen or other therapies, sometimes there's not enough lubrication, which is a transudate uh, related to sexual activity and arousal. So there are various lubricants available. Last I checked, over 200 different brands, but they basically fall into three categories and mixtures. They're water-based lubricants like we use to examine patients in the office, silicone-based lubricants, which are longer lasting but more expensive and more difficult to wash off, and oil-based lubricants. In addition, there are hybrids of all of these, two different ones or even all three of these uh, types of lubricants that are widely available. Um, it's important to note that not all lubricants, and in particular lubricants which contain mineral oil or non-natural oils, may not all be condom compatible. And while we think of menopausal women as being uh, free of the need of condoms for contraception, they are not necessarily free of the need for condoms for prevention of transmission of sexually transmitted infections. So we need condoms to be strong and safe uh, and oil-based lubricants will damage condoms, uh, at least latex condoms. Estrogen and drugs and devices that cause estrogen-like changes can have many downstream benefits in addition to just thickening and increased rugation of the vaginal barrel. They are listed for you here. They include perception and nerve changes, uh, improvement in lubrication and pH, as I've already alluded, as well as changes in the ability of the vaginal vault to relax and dilate uh, for sexual activity um, and penetration. So we, here is a list. It is a fairly complete list of those products that are FDA approved 
to treat vulvovaginal atrophy due to menopause. They include estradiol vaginal cream and its generic, conjugated equine vaginal cream, estradiol vaginal tablets, estradiol vaginal rings, and this is a point of importance because there are two vaginal rings, S-string, which is for local delivery of estrogen only, an effect that helps locally, but is not to be counted upon for treatment of menopausal symptoms like vasomotor symptoms. And then there is femring, which is a vaginal ring that delivers estrogen not only to the local vaginal epithelium, but also to the systemic circulation. And it is approved for um, treatment of vasomotor symptoms. Then we have asfina, which is not an estrogen. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator or a mixed estrogen agonist antagonist, which is FDA approved for both vulvovaginal atrophy and GSM symptoms, but is also independently approved for vaginal dryness. Uh, prasterone or DHEA, which goes under the name of intrarosa, which has both estrogenic and androgenic effects and is approved for dyspareunia. And Invexi, the newest kid on the block, which is a very low dose vaginal estradiol insert that um, is the lowest dose of estradiol approved by the FDA for use in the US, and it's approved for dyspareunia. So let's focus on each of these very briefly. Ospemaphine, as I mentioned, is an estrogen receptor agonist and antagonist. It acts on both the ER alpha and ER beta receptors, which makes it a mixed agonist and antagonist. And it's been demonstrated to decrease uh, <clears throat> the most bothersome symptom of dyspareunia, highly statistically significant in two different studies. And it's also been demonstrated in two studies to uh, improve vaginal dryness, here listed as vaginal dryness. In this paper, uh, first author, Dr. David Archer. In addition, ospemaphine has been shown to improve various aspects of sexual function on the female sexual function index, as noted here. An improvement in desire, arousal, lubrication, orgasm, sexual satisfaction, while still reducing sexual pain. And in each of these cases, with the exception of orgasm and satisfaction, these effects occur within the four weeks of using the product statistically significantly more than placebo. Dr. Erwin Goldstein, Andrew Kaunitz, and I, as well as a group of others, demonstrated that ospemaphine could in fact cause regrowth of the vaginal tissues and specifically the labia minora, which you can see before and after pictures uh, demonstrated here to be highly effective. I'll point you to the 12 week data looking at the, um, the uh, labia minora here versus the labia minora here, and just how robust those changes were as demonstrated by these blinded images. Healthcare costs uh, may be a reason to choose one therapy versus another. And as it relates to ospemaphine, it is one of the lower costs of therapy because it is used orally and seldom requires additional visits or additional um, uh, follow-up because people know how to take pills. It's not that complicated. The PI for us, Pemaphine in the US is kind of interesting. 
And it's, uh, uh, it says, as it relates to breast cancer, that osfina, ospemaphine, has not been adequately studied in women with breast cancer, and therefore it should not be used in women with known or suspected breast cancer or with a history of breast cancer. This is the US FDA approved uh, product insert. However, the exact same product, ospemaphine 60 milligrams, in the EU product insert has a very different um, uh, sense. And in fact, as it relates to breast cancer, Sentio, the uh, name for ospemaphine in the EU, while not studied formally in those with the history of breast cancer, it goes on to say, can be used for the treatment uh, in breast cancer as an adjuvant. And in fact, it suggests that it might be a good possibility for its use in that setting. So it's quite weird that in the US, it's not indicated, but in the UK, for example, it might specifically be. To that point, uh, we studied the use of uh, ospemaphine in breast cancer survivors from a large UK database, demonstrating that the risk of recurrence is actually reduced compared to non-users of estrogen or any other therapy um, uh, in breast cancer survivors. And that's been published and is noted for you here, published in uh, 20, Maturitas in uh, 2020. So intrarosa or DHEA, sometimes called prasterone, is, uh, works in a very different way than most people think. We have endocrine metabolism where we take an estrogen, for example, it goes into the cell and has an effect on the cell going through the endocrine system and the bloodstream. We have paracrine effects where one cell secretes a compound and goes to the neighboring cell. We have autocrine effects where a particular cell secretes a compound circles back on itself and has an impact on that cell itself. But intrachrinology is demonstrated here where a certain product, in this case DHEA, goes into the cell, into the cell nucleus, and then has uh, additional fact, effects on that cell itself as it relates to prasterone or DHEA, that is a precursor in sensitive cells where it's taken up into that cell and has both estrogenic and androgenic effects. And those cells are in fact, the cells of the lower genital tract, vagina, base of the bladder and urethra. But it is completely inactive in the endometrium. So here's the endometrial cells on baseline, and you can see that after 52 weeks of prasterone, six and a half milligrams a day, that the vaginal epithelium is completely unchanged from its premenopausal or baseline uh, pathology. Prasterone, just like uh, ospemaphine, has been shown to have a benefit for sexual function. And this published uh, paper from uh, Libri et al. demonstrates uh, benefits for desire, arousal, lubrication, orgasm, satisfaction, and pain. Uh, each of those domains improved by 12 weeks compared to uh, day one uh, or a matching placebo. Invexi, FDA approved for treatment of vulvovaginal atrophy, and in particular uh, to provide benefit for dyspareunia, uh, has two doses, a typical 10 microgram dose, which has been standard for vaginal uh, inserts for many years, but also a four microgram dose, which shows statistically significant benefits 
or changes in those superficial and paravasal cells and vaginal pH, improving all of them in a statistically significant fashion more toward the premenopausal level, but also improving uh, the um, uh, symptom of dyspareunia over the course of 12 weeks in a dose-dependent fashion compared to placebo uh, demonstrated here in this published paper by Constantine et al. I also want to mention for your menopausal women with um, breast cancer or breast cancer survivors that the uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2018 published guidelines from the Canadian um, Oncology Group uh, from Ontario, Canada, suggesting that for women with a current history of breast cancer who are on aromatase inhibitors and who have not responded to previous therapy, referring to non-hormonal uh, or non-RX therapy, lubricants and moisturizers, that they too can use DHEA. And they go on to also emphasize the safety of ospemaphine in those on aromatase inhibitors. This slide is meant to just show how low the amounts of estrogen are in these new vaginal therapies. Compared to Femring, as I demonstrated for you, uh, which is used for treatment not only of the vagina, but also hot flashes, the estrace cream is seven milligrams a year, and down from there with the low dose four microgram Invexi insert being less than a half a milligram per year in total delivered estrogen amount, a very, very small amount indeed. In spite of that, and in spite of comparing the levels of estrogen delivered to the systemic circulation by four micrograms of Invexi and the uh, DHEA or intrarosa prasterone insult insert, the blood level C average 3.6 picograms per mil and average PG uh, average about uh, in the same range. The, the answer is that the FDA has labeled these compounds very, very differently. Um, one says, as the class label for estrogen products uh, mentions the WHI and systemic therapy, mentions pulmonary embolism, endometrial cancer, um, and uh, possible dementia, as opposed to the Prasterone insert, which has no mention of any of those uh, adverse effects of estrogen. I want to bring to everybody's uh, attention the fact that women with severe um, uh, vaginal atrophy or GSM may need physical therapy or pelvic floor physical therapy or dilator physical therapy in order to re establish normal anatomy. This is a set of progressive dilators uh, ranging from pencil to porn star, I would say, uh, but, but these may be required or other uh, similar dilation type devices may be required to break up vaginal agglutinations and to improve insertional dyspareunia. I did mention that um, recently, this is from the American Urogynecological Society, and by the way, the Euro Urology Society also in 21, 2021 and 2022 respectively did come out with guidelines suggesting that vaginal estrogen can be used as first-line therapy for recurrent urinary tract infections in postmenopausal women. This is a 
big advance in my opinion, because these women had commonly been treated over and over and over again with antibiotics, often increasingly expensive and increasingly potent antibiotics as those recurrent urinary tract infections uh, came over and over again. And we know, as I've told you, uh, that estrogen and medications like uh, or that become estrogens in the vagina or systemic circulation can reduce urinary tract infections in postmenopausal women with those infections. So consider that another good reason to estrogenize the vagina. So um, there may be in the future lower doses of estrogen, even lower than four micrograms. Uh, estriol and estetrol, metabolites, metabolites of estradiol, uh, will be coming to the U.S. Estriol is available ex-U.S., and estetrol is under investigation for its use in uh, GSM symptoms. Uh, vaginal use of tamoxifen may be estrogenic enough to be used for GSM symptoms. Certainly, our oncology colleagues would be reassured by using a tamoxifen vaginally in our breast cancer survivors. There are other SERMs in the pipeline, including vaginal lasofoxifene uh, for uh, treating a vulvovaginal atrophy or GSM, as well as other therapies, including, as I mentioned at the top, lasers and radiofrequency devices for treatment of GSM symptoms. So in summary, under low estrogen conditions like menopause, the vagina becomes shorter, narrower, less elastic, and more prone to injury. The vaginal epithelium thins, becomes less well-rugated, can crack, become less vascular and less elastic, and can actually bleed with minimal or no contact. The labia minora thin, become shorter, thinner, less vascular, and may disappear. The clitoris regresses, becomes smaller, less vascular, and less sensitive. The vaginal pH rises, that is, it gets more basic, less acidic, and the local environment becomes more easily colonized with fungi, coliforms, even viruses. The shortened urethra, proximity to coliforms, and increased pH lead to increased risk of asymptomatic bacteria and urinary tract infections. And the vestibule becomes thinner, more sensitive to pain as nerve fibers get closer to the surface in contact with irritants and penetration, and the vestibular glands demonstrate irritation and sensitivity, including erythema. As a consequence of all of these, touch, whether sexual or not, becomes unpleasant, if not painful. Penetrating vaginal intercourse becomes unpleasant, if not painful or impossible. Arousal and orgasm become muted or impossible. Sexual activity ceases, and anxiety and depression, including major depressive disorder, can follow as women have a lower sense of self and lower sense of sexual self. While GSM is, in fact, a natural sign of aging and comparable biologically to those evolutionarily advantageous changes of lactation, BVA and GSM have an adverse effect on genital urinary health, sexuality, relationships, quality of life, and it is preventable and treatable. In the 2020 Genital Urinary Syndrome of Menopause Position Statement of the North American Menopause Society, each and every one of these points is reemphasized. So remember, pink and plump, not pale and frail. And I thank you very much for your kind attention to this, my first of two lectures.